Today class, we're going to be learning about wound care. And wound, wounds can be fascinating to look at. There's something that in your CNA training, when you're going to your clinical site, if your resident has a wound and the wound nurse is coming in to help take care of it, see if you can stay in the room, see if you can learn about it. Most of the wound nurses are just, they love to help teach the students about how to care for them. So the first thing we need to talk about before we talk about wounds is just the skin and what it does for you. So your skin is part of your integumentary system and it is your body's first line of defense. It is the first barrier that you have against infection. So it is important that we keep it intact, the skin and the mucous membranes, because if we have cuts or scrapes or any type of wound, that is going to be a portal of entry for bacteria. So we want to prevent skin injuries and we want to make sure we give good skin care. The other things that our skin does is it helps us synthesize vitamin D. So remember vitamin D is um, synthesized through sunlight and it only takes about 10 to 20 minutes to get um, enough vitamin D from the sun every day. The other thing it does is it has a subcutaneous fat layer in the skin to help provide warmth and cushion and protection. It has heat and cold and pain receptors, so it can help regulate our body temperature. Um, if when we get really hot, we will sweat, and when we get really cold, we can ship, you know, we shiver. So our skin is um, integral into good health. And so it's something as a CNA, when you're bathing someone, when you're giving them a shower, um, you know, when we're giving them that bed bath, we're going to be assessing the skin. We're going to be looking at that skin to make sure it looks healthy and stays clean. So when we talk about what a wound is, it's a break in the skin or the mucous membranes. And it can be an intentional wound or an unintentional wound. And what I mean by an intentional wound, an example of that would be surgery. So if you go for surgery and you go into a surgical, for a surgical procedure, they are going to usually make an incision. Now it's intentional, which means it's going to be done under sterile procedure. It's going to have sterile instruments doing the cuts. They're going to clean the skin before it happens. So they're going to try really hard to um, keep it from getting infected. Now, even surgical wounds can get infected, but a lot less likely than wounds caused by trauma or by pressure. So another type of wound would be a wound caused by trauma and trauma is an unintentional injury. So it's something hap it's something that we didn't intend to happen and it does happen. So usually there's jagged edges involved to the skin when the skin gets broken open or there's dirt in it because it wasn't obviously something that was planned for or had you know proper instruments to be able to cause it this was unintentional and so usually they're very dirty so much more likely to get infected. Pressure ulcers, which we'll look at a whole chapter just on pressure ulcers. And then another cause of wounds um, of, of having that break in the skin or the mucous membranes can be from decreased blood flow. So we'll look at circulatory ulcers today as well, where the person might have poor venous or poor arterial blood flow to their body. Usually we tend to see that in the lower extremities more than anywhere else. And then nerve damage, if the person has a neurological condition where they don't have the same sensation that other people do, um, maybe they've had a stroke and they don't sense one part of their body anymore, um, or maybe they have something like multiple sclerosis where they've um, lost that, you know, that voluntary and involuntary movements for a lot of them. Um, we can have nerve damage from people that are diabetics. So that can also um, cause, an, it, cause a potential issue because a lot of times people that have nerve damage, they don't even realize they're getting a wound or that the wound's getting infected until it, it's already really bad. One of the issues with a wound, one of our major complications of a wound is infection. That is always going to be a concern with any wound, an intentional or an unintentional wound. So I thought this picture was kind of nice. It shows you an incision. So an incision would be an intentional wound, a nice clean straight cut. So usually, I mean, that's the type of thing that you might see um, in surgery. Again, it's planned for, it's sterile instruments, it's it's skin's been clean, but we do a nice clean cut into the skin. And so usually those tend to heal a little bit better. 
An avulsion, if you think about like slicing your hand open or you're cutting something and you cut part of your finger off, maybe it's cut off altogether, that would be an avulsion. Or maybe it's just hanging by a skin tag, that would be an avulsion. A puncture wound, getting a, um, a needle, a piece of glass, a, a nail, something like that stuck through your skin. Or an abrasion, if you could just think about falling down and skinning your hands and knees on the asphalt, though it causes minute skin tears throughout the skin. Very painful because the nerve endings are then exposed, but also usually very dirty. And then a laceration, those are usually caused by unintentional, that's from trauma, where you've had unintentional tears in the skin. So usually the tears are dirtier and they're more jagged. So we'll start looking at skin tears, and a skin tear is a break or a rip in the skin, and it's usually caused from what we call friction and shearing. And friction, if you think about when we taught you to wash your hands and you put that water and soap on and you're causing friction, you're rubbing them together, you're purposely causing that um, rubbing sensation to, to get all that bacteria off your hands, that's friction. But when you have friction where you have skin rubbing over skin or you have um, bony parts of the body rubbing against other bony parts of the body, that skin in between it can start actually get, you know, cause friction and end up tearing open. Shearing is another term that we, can, that we use to refer to with skin tears. And shearing, so let's say you have a patient who's been sitting in bed and they're all sweaty, their back's all sweaty and it's kind of stuck to the sheets or stu you know, stuck to the bed. And now instead of lifting them up, say with a draw sheet, you're kind of drag them up in bed and it can actually cut, the skin can stick to where it's at in the bed while you're dragging them up and then the skin just literally tears open. So you'll see it from friction and shearing. We see it when we pull, you know, pulling on the person or, um, causing pressure on the skin, bumping a hand, arm, or leg on any hard surface can cause, you know, friction and shearing, can cause skin tears, holding a person's arm or leg too tight. And you'll see this sometimes when CNAs, instead of using their gait belt, instead of just taking that time to put a gait belt around their waist and, and help pull them up or help sit them up or stand them up with that gait belt, and they just grab them by the arms and they're trying to pull them up and then let's say they start to slip or fall and you kind of tug on their skin or on their arm and it just tears their skin open. This is another type of skin tear. This is really common with our elderly population uh, because one of the things that happens to the skin as we age is it produces less oils and so it becomes much drier. So the skin becomes very dry and when the skin becomes dry, um, it can tend to tear a little bit easier. The other thing that happens as a person gets older is the tissue integrity, the, the connectivity, um, connective tissue of the skin ends up starting to break down. So the skin becomes much more fragile. And so something like this right here, this probably happened just from tape, just having tape pulled off of them. So when we put a, a dressing on a person who has a wound, they try to use things to help hold it in place that don't require any tape. And if you do have to use tape on an elderly person, we want to be careful about what kind of tape we use. So for instance, with when we start learning at about some of the dressing supplies that can be used for a wound. There's paper tapes. That would be much better for an elderly person with fragile skin than something like a silk tape or a really strong adhesive tape or a foam tape that really sticks really tight to the skin. Because sometimes when you pull those off, we can just end up taking the skin with it. So skin tears are portals of entry for infection, and that's always our concern with this when it happens. So if you accidentally cause a skin tear or you find a skin tear, make sure you report it. Please don't be afraid to report it. I know sometimes CNAs, especially brand new CNAs, it's like, oh my God, I can't tell anybody this happened because you know I caused their skin to rip and I'm going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble if it gets found and you didn't report it is what, when you're going to get in trouble for it. Even when we try to be very careful, sometimes these things can still happen, but we're always going to try to prevent harm for our resident. Our goal is always to give good quality care and to prevent harm from happening. So let's say we were wearing our wedding ring 
And one of the reasons we always tell you in class, you know, no jewelry in the facilities. We don't want you to be wearing anything other than just a simple band, a really simple watch. If you wear a watch that has a lot of gauges on it, or you've got a ring that's got a nice big diamond that sticks out, and now you're trying to tuck sheets underneath the person, or you're trying to put your hands underneath them to help lift them up, it's really easy to poke them or to cause a tear in their skin from that from that jewelry or from that watch. We see it from long nails. So it's one of the reasons that we tell you very short nails. Um, you should never have artificial nails, gel nails, and your nails should be short. When you hold your hand up, you should not see your nails over your fingers. Um, so, and it's because we don't want to hurt these people. Their skin is very, very fragile. And especially if they don't have good circulation, it's not going to heal real quickly. Okay. So if we don't take care of it, it, you know, it can just get worse. So if we do accidentally cause that skin tear, make sure we report it. Let the nurse know. Yes, an incident report is going to be filled out. But I have seen this happen before where people have caused accidental injuries. They didn't mean to hurt the person, but they accidentally, you know, their ring caught something or their watch caught something and they ended up tearing the skin a little bit and they were afraid they were going to get in trouble so they don't say anything. Well, if it gets infected, and if that infection gets really bad and goes into the blood supply, it can really harm the person. And then the other thing that can happen is if you don't report this, that it happened and write up what happened, then let's say the next shift coming on, they find it, you know, they find the wound, so they report it. And when they ask the person what happened, they said, oh yeah, that nurse on day shift, she did this to me. Now you're going to have an abuse report filed against you, and that's going to go through all of that investigation. So you always want to make sure you're reporting things if you accidentally do something that accidentally harms a person. So another type of injury is a circulatory ulcer. And I know in your book it talks about um, it talks about venous ulcers and arterial ulcers. I don't really expect you as a CNA to be able to differentiate between the two, but circulatory ulcers or vascular ulcers happen when the blood flow is poor. So whether it's an arterial blood flow that is pumping blood from the heart to the body, or if it's the venous return that's coming from the body back up to the heart, either if one or both of those sides isn't working properly, we aren't going to get enough blood and oxygen to the tissue, and it's going to be more it's going to predispose that person to open sores. We tend to see this more on the lower legs and the feet from the poor blood flow because that's generally furthest away from the heart. And so we tend to see it a little bit more commonly there. These wounds are very painful, very, very hard to heal because they already have poor circulation. So they're getting poor oxygenation to that tissue and we need tissue needs good oxygenation to heal properly. So these are some examples. So something like this, you can see here where this on this leg here on the right leg, we tend to, it actually tends to look like a normal leg fairly much. You see some discoloration down here and we tend to start seeing that when people do have circulatory problems, their skin tends to start discoloring on the lower part of the legs. Sometimes it can turn kind of a, a dark red or a purplish color. Sometimes you'll actually see it'll look kind of um, tan or leathery almost. This leg, you can see that we've got some swelling going on to the leg, definitely some poor circulation going on here, and it looks like you might even have an open wound here as well. This type of wound here, probably caused by poor circulation, something like this, this is never going to heal. This is called eschar, and it, it is, it's kind of like the dead slough that's the dead tissue and the, and the pussy purulent drainage that's come out of it. And it's just kind of make this dry, hard caked, um, film over the wound. It will never heal like this. This person's going to need to go in and have a procedure, like a surgical procedure done, have all that dead tissue scraped off till they get, get to good, clean, viable tissue. And then it's going to need a lot of wound care to ever get it to heal again. So here's another example. This is what I was talking about, that kind of dry, leathery looking um, look to the tissue. You tend to see this a lot with poor circulation, but after a while, the skin can actually just start breaking down. Maybe it rubbed up against something. Maybe the person bumped or hit up against something, broke open that skin, but now it's really going to struggle to heal because it's, you know, because they do have such poor circulation. 
I have a friend who has peripheral vascular disease. She has poor circulation to her lower extremities and she got bit by a poisonous spider. And oh, it caused this horrible, horrible wound and they, they just, they couldn't get it to heal. She was going in for specialty wound treatments and it still wasn't healing. And so they sent her to a wound center that actually did hyperbaric chamber treatments where they super oxygenate the tissues, still wasn't healing. They ended up doing stem cell therapy to the area. They were concerned she was going to lose her leg at one point. It took over two years before her leg finally healed. So these things are very painful. They're very slow healing because we have such poor circulation and oxygenation to those tissues. So how do we prevent this and, and, and what do we do about these? So for one thing, we want to prevent skin breakdown. We want to make sure how we're handling the person. We want to move them gently. We want to make sure when we're transferring and we use those gate belts, we, you know, we're careful in, in where we grab them and how we hold them. Another thing that they really want people with circulatory issues to do is to get good professional foot care. So we've talked about in class, it's okay to soak a person's feet. It's okay to clean under their toenails or if they have rough, you know, rough areas of their toenails, we can take an emery board and file them, but we don't cut them. And the reason they don't want us as CNAs to cut the toenails is because if we accidentally cut too much and let's say we give them an ingrown toenail or we cut off part of the cuticles and stuff, Again, these people have poor circulation and there's a good chance they're not going to have good blood flow down there for it to heal properly. So they really want them to have a podiatrist come and take a look at their feet. There's also devices and we'll show you some pictures and um, the section when we go over pressure ulcers. There are air mattresses that can be used. There are foam um, foam holders that will hold the feet, the lower legs and the foot in a foam encasing so it's nice and padded. Um, there's egg crates, there's foot cradles to keep the blankets and, and sheets and stuff from putting pressure on the lower legs and the foot. So there are different devices that we can use that might be ordered to help promote um, better blood flow to the area and to keep pressure from happening. The other thing we might see is some elastic stockings or elastic bandages, especially for people with poor circulation. So elastic stockings, they put pressure down on the lower legs, on the ankles and the lower legs, and it's a tighter pressure on the lower legs and it gets looser as it comes up the leg to promote blood flow that's sitting down in those lower legs to come on up. Now, another type of wound that we'll see is a diabetic foot ulcer. And diabetes is a very difficult disease and it really will depend on how well a person manages it as to how a person does with that diabetes. There is what we call insulin dependent diabetes where the person has to take insulin injections and their body doesn't make, their body doesn't make any insulin. And so they have to take insulin injections um, to help control their, their blood sugars or they may not actually utilize their insulin correctly. So they may actually still make insulin, but their body doesn't uptake it properly or doesn't utilize it correctly. So when you're looking, so basically what a di diabetic is, what's happening with them is their body is, either isn't making or uptaking the insulin correctly. And that insulin is what your body uses to help utilize the carbohydrates and the sugars that you take in from your food to be able to utilize it as energy. Now, the problem with diabetes is it ends up causing nerve damage. So over a period of time, if the person doesn't regulate their blood flow really well, it can cause um, nerve damage and it also can affect the blood vessels. So it's going to decrease the blood flow that's going to the person. So one of the problems with, with diabetes when they get a wound is it very easily can become infected. And if the tissue ends up dying, it can turn into gangrene, which is death of the tissue. And the only way you can get rid of gangrene when you've got a wound that's turned gangrenous is to actually cut it out. So a lot of times amputations happen with our diabetic patients. They have to remove the affected part to try to prevent that spread of the gangrene. Once the death of the tissue happens and it turns gangrenous, it releases, a, uh, there's chemical releases that happen that can start causing damage to the tissue in the nearby area. 
So one of the things we always teach with diabetics is to look at their feet every day. Make sure that at the end of the day when they take their shoes off, for one thing, they should never be going around barefoot, but when they take their shoes off, just look at their feet. Are there any blisters? Are there any sores, any reddened areas where those shoes have been rubbing um, improperly? Any cuts? Did they stub their toe? Did they, I, I mean, anything that looks off on the feet, we want to make sure we're addressing that and, and making sure the nurse is aware of it. Um, and, and patients that go home, we tell them, you know, if you have anything wrong with your feet, anything that doesn't look right, go in and see a podiatrist right away before it gets infected. Because what can happen is something like this. These wounds are just, they're, they're very, very deep. They don't heal properly because they have poor circulation and poor nerve function to it. Sometimes these people can step on something and they're getting this wound on the bottom of their foot and they don't even feel it until it gets really bad. And so that's why we want to teach diabetics, look at your feet every day. Make sure you, there's not something there that you don't didn't see before and, and, and really get aggressive treatment for it early before it has a chance to get bad. Because if the tissue ends up dying, if we can't get it to heal, I mean, a lot of times you'll see a toe cut off and then sometimes the next toe gets cut off. And then if that didn't stop the spread, they cut off part of the foot. And, and you'll see a lot of amputations are very, very common with diabetics. So things that can impact wound healing in general, the type of wound, okay, is it is, is the type of wound from a circulatory ulcer because we have poor circulation? Is it from diabetes? Is it from a, a bite? Is it from trauma? So what is the type of wound? Was it a surgical wound? The person's overall age and their general health. So the older we are, we know it's going to be a little, you know, their, their skin loses its integrity. It doesn't heal quite as well. Their general health, how healthy are they normally? Their nutritional status. Wounds need, you need good protein sources. So remember our protein, when we talked about nutrition, protein helps with tissue growth and repair. So we want to make sure that we've got good protein sources. And if you're feeding a patient who's there and they have wounds and you're seeing that, you know, they've got chicken and they've got salad and they've got fruit and they've got a cookie, really try to encourage them to take those protein sources first because it's so critical for that tissue growth and repair. Um, circulation. How's their underlying circulation to their body? Do they have good circulation? If not, it's going to impact that wound healing. Certain medications can actually suppress the immune system and actually decrease or slow down wound healing. And immune ch system changes. Do they have cancer? Do they have HIV? Is there some type of system or some type of disease process that's, that's impacting their immune system that will keep them from being able to, their tissues from being able to heal? Complications of wounds, a big one is hemorrhaging. So if a person has trauma, they've had unintentional injury um, where they've got these jagged cuts or and tears, they can bleed. So hemorrhage is an excessive amount, an excessive loss of blood in a short amount of time. And that can lead to shock. And so when we talked about the um, emergency procedures section, um, there's a there's multiple different types of shock, but I really mentioned hypovolemic shock, anaphylactic shock, and septic shock. Hypovolemic shock, hypovolume, hypovolemic. Hypo is low, volemic is volume. So low volume shock. That can happen from severe dehydration and it happens from hemorrhaging. There might be anaphyla anaphylactic shock we really don't see with wounds. That's from an allergic reaction. But then there's septic shock. And septic shock is when a wound gets infected and it gets into the bloodstream and it starts attacking other areas of the body, they can go into what we call sepsis and go into septic shock, which is very, very dangerous and has a very high death rate associated with it. So always keep in mind when a person is bleeding and you notice a drop in blood pressure, the heart rate's going up, they feel cold and clammy, um, they may be dazed or, or confused. They, there's a good chance they're going into shock and you need to make sure you get them help right away. Well, if they're bleeding, you need to get them help right away anyway. If you have a person that has an infection, now a when we talked about the infection control section, if you're dealing with an infection, a localized infection, you might see redness or swelling 
or drainage. And pussy drainage is called purulent drainage. Uh, we might notice something like that. But when it gets into the system, when it starts getting into the system and it can cause a reaction called sepsis, you'll see, a t usually with infection, you'll see a fever, blood pressure will drop, heart rate will go up. When you start noticing that, you want to make sure you notify the nurse right away. This person needs immediate treatment or there's a good chance they can go into septic shock, which has about a 50% death rate associated with it. There's also what we call dehiscence and evisceration, and those are surgical emergencies. Dehiscence is when the separation of wound layers, so let's say the person's had surgery and the wound splits open, or an evisceration is when the wound splits open and then things fall out of it, okay? And so here is an example of um, dehiscence, the wound has split open. This would be dehiscence with wound evisceration and so where things are coming out of it. And this is, you ha they have to go back into surgery. They have to go into surgery to get this fixed or get this repaired. Now, a wound that's really, really deep like this, actually this one they may not take in for surgery because just sewing the edges here together isn't gonna be enough. They have to get this to heal from the bottom up. So what they do is they do wound packing and they pack that wound and each time they're packing it, they leave like the next layer open so so tissue could growth can grow in layer by layer by layer and fill that area in versus just closing the top layers and still having that deep pocket underneath there so wound drainage um, i do want you to learn the terms of this wound drainage um, we we do look at wound drainage we observe it we can measure it depending on how they're collecting it but serous drainage is clear watery fluid so it looks clear, it may look a pale yellow color, but it's watery in texture. Sanguinous is thick and bloody. It's a thick, bloody drainage. So serosanguinous is thin, watery drainage that's blood tinged. So serous is clear, sanguinous is bloody, serosanguinous is watery, blood tinged. And then the term purulent is the fancy word for pus. So thick, green, yellow, brown type of drainage. That would be purulent drainage. So some wounds have drains put in them, and this is, happens with surgery. We don't generally see them so much with trauma, but you see them a lot in surgery. So let's say the person has had a, a pelvic surgery done. Maybe they had a hysterectomy, and there's still and an area is bleeding in here, and they don't want it to just pull up in the body. There needs to be a way for it to get out of the body. So what they do is they can put a drain, and part of the drain will go in the wound, and part of the drain comes out. And then you put dressings over that, so the drain drainage that's inside is going to leak, come out, and then leak onto the dressings. So this would be a type of an open drain. A closed drain, there's pictures of them in your book. There is a Jackson Pratt drain, and that will have a drain that goes into the wound, but then it comes to a collection chamber. It looks like a bulb um, collection chamber, so the drainage is going to come into the collection chamber, and you can actually empty that drainage. So at the end of your shift, when you do intake and outputs, you can actually empty the the drainage out and measure it so you can put it on the intake and out or on the output record on your intake and output sheets um, and then and then the collection chamber will start filling up again so there's Jackson Pratt drains and there's um, hemovac drains and those they're just types of wound drainage vacs that part of part of the tube will stay in here in the wound part of it comes out but it's a collection chamber that it comes out to versus something like this where it's just going to have dressings covered it up and as they soak up as they get bloody you're just going to need to keep we just would keep changing the dressings so drainage is measured either by weighing the dressings and we don't usually do that very often but you can actually weigh the old dressings to see how much they weigh so you can actually take the weight you can calculate the weight of the volume that way or we can just note how many size how many times we had to change the dressing and we had to change the dressing three times on the shift we can also get a me measure wound drainage by measuring the amount of drainage in the collection chamber so wound dressings have the following functions. They protect wounds from injury and microbes. They absorb drainage. They remove dead tissue. They can promote comfort. And they can cover unsightly wounds. They, and, and they can apply pressure. You can actually have pressure dressings to help control bleeding. Now the type of the type of dressing and the size of the dressing is going to depend on the type of wound, the wound size and location, the amount of drainage, 
if there's infection going on, the dressing's function, and how often it needs to be changed. So the doctor and or the nurse will choose the best type of dressing. Sometimes the doctors will say, I want you to take care of it, and they'll order a specific type of dressing. Most of the time, they will leave it up to the nurse to determine what type of dressing they think would be best to cover it up with. Now, in the nursing homes, we are going to have wound nurses. So they actually have a wound nurse that is going to um, go around every day and take a look at the wound and change the dressings on it. Um, as a CNA, we are allowed as a CNA to do simple wound dressings. So simple wound dressing, no packings involved, no medications involved. It is not a sterile procedure. It's just like a new gauze square that needs to go over a, um, an incision with just regular tape. Nothing sterile about it, nothing medicated with it, no type of packing with it. CNAs are allowed to do that, but that will depend on the policy of the facility where you work. Most nursing homes have wound nurses and they will usually do the dressing changes. So there's all different types of dressing supplies. There's what we call Telfa dressings, where they won't stick to the wound. There's gauze dressings that will help soak up blood better. There's medicated dressings where there's already some type of medication on it to help with infection. And there's all different types of tapes, you know, silk tapes, foam tapes, um, paper tapes. So the type of dressing supplies will, de again, depend on that type of what the wound actually is. If you do have to do a dressing change, you're gonna wear gloves. So you're gonna make sure you have gloves on. And then what you're gonna do is we would take the old tape off. So we would take the old tape off and you peel the tape into the dressing. So on this side, I'm gonna peel the tape up this way to the dressing and then I'm gonna to come to this side and peel it this way. And then when I pull the dressing off, I'm gonna pull it, I'm gonna pull it this way and I'm gonna pull it so the person sees the back of the dressing. I don't want to start up here at the top and pull it down so they're looking at the dressing discharge. Some people get really grossed out by looking at purulent drainage or bloody drainage. So we always take it off in a way that the patient isn't going to see what's on that dressing. So I have my gloves on. I would pull the tape off. I'm going to take the dressing off carefully in a way so the person doesn't see the type of drainage that's on it. And then I'm, and that's going to get thrown away and I'm going to take those gloves off and I'm going to hand sanitize. Now I'm going to put clean gloves on and I could put a new clean gauze on here and we tape over the top of the dressing, the middle of the dressing, and the bottom of the dressing. Now, if you have a person that you don't want there to be tape on, these are binders. So this is something that I could just put a binder around that dressing to help hold it in place so I wouldn't even have to put tape on their body. And let's say you have someone who's had a mastectomy and they've got a lot of um, dressings on their chest. They have chest binders, okay, that will help hold those dressings in place so you aren't having to use a lot of tape. These here, these, this is called Montgomery straps. And this part right here and on this side right here, that actually is taped to the skin. But then this part here is just flaps. So what happens is you would untie this, those flaps fold back. You can take the old dressing off, put the new dressing on, put the flaps back and tie it back up. And that way you don't have to keep pulling tape on and off of them. So these are just different things that can be used to try to minimize tape, especially with our elderly population. We really don't want to use tape if we can help it um, because, again, their skin is so fragile and it's so easy to cause skin tears when we're pulling tape off. So as I mentioned, when we're changing dressings, we take off the old dressings so they don't see the drainage, we remove our dirty gloves, we sanitize, put new gloves on, and then we put our new dressing materials with um, our clean gloves on. And again, we tape over the top, the middle, and the bottom of the dressing. As far as meeting basic needs, remember wounds can actually cause a lot of um, discomfort for a person, so they may need pain relief depending on the wound. Good nutrition, can't stress this enough. They need good nutrition, good protein sources. Um, pain and odors from the wound can affect their appetite. Infection is always something that we're worried about. We always want to be looking at, you know, is that wound getting infected? Is it getting red? Is it getting hot? Is it getting streaks off of it? Is it getting swollen? Are they starting to run a fever? Do they have chills or aches? Those are things we want to know because 
it, they can get really dangerous. And the other thing with wounds is they can affect body image. I mean, it's depending on where the wound is, if it's on the face, if it's on a really visible place, you know, it might be something that's really bothers them just because of the aesthetics of what it looks like. So it can really impact body wounds can impact body image and their emotional, um, how they feel emotionally because of that wound as well. So we're going to stop here. And again, if you do get the chance to, you know, seriously, if you do get the chance to go in with a wound nurse, if your resident that you're taking care of is getting dressing changes done, it's really a great opportunity to just look and see what they're doing because they can be really, really fascinating. And if you really do like wounds, if it's something that you do find fascinating, when you, if you go on for your nursing career later in your nursing career, after you, if you go on for LVN or RN, you can take, you can actually become a wound care specialist. And it's a, um, it's a, it's a really big, it's a really, um, interesting specialty field that you can go into. We have some wound specialists at the hospital. Um, where I also work. And if the doctors, if they've got a wound that's not healing properly, they'll call the wound nurses to come in and say, hey, what do I order? What do I do for this? I mean, it's it's really a fascinating topic and it is a really unique specialty. So we will go ahead and stop here for our wound care. And we're gonna continue next with our pressure ulcers. <music>